counterculture. And, and in this series, we're going to look at how Jesus showed us the way to do just that through all the highs and lows of life. Jesus lived in a way that was counterculture. What Jesus did went against the grain, went against the flow, it went against the normal. But maybe, just maybe, we miss a part of that because in the religious circles of the world, we're like, yes, that's right, in the world, not of the world. It's all true, it's all exactly right, we should look different. But you need to get to the why that Jesus lived counterculture. And maybe there's an element we miss of what being counterculture really looks like. Jesus went against the grain. Jesus was counterculture. Jesus was in this world, but not of this world. So that, so that he could display the love of God into that very culture that he went counter to in a way that would forever change the world. That, my friends, is exactly what we are called to do. And it's not an easy task. Can I get an amen? It's a hard world to live in such a way. And so we're going to go through for several weeks just looking at what it means in Old New Testament to live counterculture. Today, I want to talk to you about counterculture generosity. And this will be part one. We always start the first part of the year trying to look at finances, look at generosity, look at stewardship. And these are the passages we'll be in. We'll be in Psalm chapter 50. In fact, both of these first two weeks will be on this one verse. And I'm going to break it apart for us. Psalm 50, the 50th Psalm, verse 14. And then a little later today, I'll get us to Luke chapter 12. And it's a parable that Jesus told as well. And here's what I know. Some of you are thinking, don't check out yet. Come back, come back. Some of you are thinking like, doggone it, I go to church and I, and I show up on the first Sunday, maybe a New Year's resolution, and this is why I don't go to church. The pastor's talking about money. I know what some of you are thinking. And here's what I want you to know. Here's why we're talking about money. We're talking about money because Jesus had a lot to say about money. In fact, it was some 13 of his parables, it's almost half of his parables were about money and possessions and stuff. And to illustrate what we hope for you, I actually want to play a little game real quick. Uh, how many of you ever done the quarter challenge before? You put the quarter on your elbow and try to catch it? All right, so here's what I want you guys to do. I want you, we've done it, it's been a few years, so it's time to bring it back. Uh, I want you guys to post however many quarters, there really is a quarter, I'll show you. Uh, cameras, you can make sure you get it there. I want you to post your video with as many of these as you can possibly do this week. Tag Black Hawk Ministries. And next week, we might just try this again, and you might could challenge me on stage. All right? So let's, let's give it a shot. Here's the first round. There's one. You want me to go for four? Let's do a dollar. I don't know. I haven't practiced it much this weekend, um, so I don't know. This was 50-50 the few times I practiced, so we'll make a sermon illustration out of our failures, too, if that happens. Here we go. You ready? Oh, yeah. All four right there. All right, challenge me this week. Post your video. You can come on stage. Join me next week. But I actually do have a point with these quarters. Here's what I hope for you these first couple of weeks. Because, listen, if we're going to live counterculture, it always needs to start with a heart. And Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So that's why we're starting this year with counterculture generosity for two weeks. And what we hope is, just like I caught it off my elbow, we hope that you, we can help you catch your finances before they catch catch you. Some of you have been caught by your finances and it has just driven you into the ground. And listen, I got a challenge for you from a pastor. You won't hear many pastors say this in Fort Wayne or elsewhere. I always say this to you. Listen, if your greatest obstacle in listening to me and in coming the first couple of weeks of the year, in letting God work in your heart in regards to your stewardship, managing something that's not your own, and your finances, if your greatest obstacle is you think I'm just doing this so that Blackhawk Ministries can get your money, I would challenge you to be generous apply these principles, but do it somewhere outside of Blackhawk. You won't hear many people say that. We give to the Lord through Blackhawk, and I challenge you, we're gonna talk about that and why God's heart's for the church, especially next week. But if that's an obstacle for you, listen, God, Jesus, Blackhawk, your pastor, we don't want something from you we want something for you. I believe that what Jesus said is actually true. It's recorded in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35 where Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We believe that with all of our heart around here. And I believe it's true for you. God doesn't want to get your money. He just doesn't want your money to get you. God wants to help you catch your finances before sometimes you get caught off guard and they might catch you. 
All right, you ready to dig in, church? Let's do that together. We're gonna have a memory verse. It's Psalm chapter 50 and verse 14. We're gonna try to memorize it. Uh, We've got a school here, and man, Jessica and I, we try to memorize with our kids the memory verses from the school, and and there's some I picked on our head of school's last service. Uh, Some of them are really long. This one's really short, and we have two weeks to learn it together. So let's do that together. We're gonna say it twice together. Psalm chapter 50, verse 14, here it is. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. Psalm 50, 14. Now let's say it again, really loud, really proud together. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. I know what some of you are thinking, like you're looking at the screen too. And we might even just take it off the screen next week and try it one time. But let's memorize that together. Here's what I want to do. For four weeks, or for four points, two weeks, four points, I'm going to give you two today, two tomorrow. There's four parts to this verse, four principles, four points that I want to give you. And the first two come from offer to God and a sacrifice of thanksgiving. I'm gonna give those to you uh, over these next two weeks. Two today, two next Sunday. The points are preparation, praise, promises, and priorities. Preparation, praise, promises, priorities. Let's go through the first two together today. Number one is preparation, write that down. In that verse, offer to God, offer to God. And that word offer is also translated as sacrifice. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, we're in the Old Testament to start. We'll flip over to Luke 12 in just a few minutes to look at the New Testament. You'll find that these principles are universal, not just in Old and New Testament, but in times past and in current day today because the word of God is powerful, it is timeless, and I thank God that these universal principles still apply to us in the same way today as they did even when these great principles were written down. But a sacrifice, if you were going to offer a sacrifice to God, because this psalm, really, you could break it into, to three different parts. Psalm chapter 50, the 50th Psalm, is what God uh, desires when it comes to worship. And if you want to read Psalm 50, great devotional material, we're just looking at one verse, but the Psalm shows what does God desire? What does God despise? you know, when it comes to worship and what does God declare over us for our worship and what he wants us to do and take away from that. It's a great Psalm. But when we think of preparation, we think of offer to God. It's a sacrifice. It takes a lot of intense and extensive preparation. You don't do that on the fly. When you were to give a a sacrifice to the Lord, you had to prepare. So we're going to talk about preparation because get this, God calls you and me. Let's make it personal. Let's contextualize to today. God calls you and me to be pre in a world that's all about post. When I hear the word post, I think of posting on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. And and it's true, we don't really prepare a lot. And it gives us a great venue to just with a a click of a button to to share before we prepare. Can I get an amen? To tweet before we think sometimes. Ever bitten any of you before perhaps? But God calls us to be pre. God calls us to think ahead. God calls us to be prepared in our finances, but in every area of stewardship and of our life. He calls us to be proactive in a world that is reactive. We're talking about counterculture. Today's world is very reactive. We react to problems with finances. Oh, we got a problem, the bank account's drained. Uh, We react on social media. We're mad about something. We type, you ever done the mad typing where you punch the keyboard really hard, your phone like this, and then you click it, and then you go, oh, what was I thinking? We're in a reactive culture, but God calls us to be proactive, to think ahead, to be pre. Write it down this way. Pre is the key. Pre is the key. It's the beginning of the word preparation, It is the key to being able to be balanced in our stewardship, in our finances. Pre is the key. We prepare our kids with preschool. We have a preschool academy here. Why? It's preschool because they're going to get into kindergarten and first grade and so forth, and hopefully they're prepared by preschool. We have young young couples getting married, and they go through premarital counseling, so they're prepared for the marriage that is to come, why wouldn't we do the same thing with our finances? You know, a lot of times our finances catch us instead of us catching it off of our elbow. Can I get an amen? God calls us to be pre. And I'm gonna be honest with you. A lot of stuff I'm gonna share, I share it every year. The same principles, it's packaged differently. We look at different texts in scripture. But the universal timeless truths of stewardship are all throughout scripture and we teach them every year about this time. And, and here's why. Because it's one thing to know what to do it's another thing to live it out. 
I would say it to you this way. If we would do, and I say we because it includes me. I'm not pointing a finger here. It's all me too. If we would do what we already knew, this sermon could be through. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Hey, I didn't even plan that one. I wasn't prepared for that one. That one just came. But it's easy to say I'm going to do something and then live a different way. This is why there's so many hypocrites in church, right? Raise your hand if you're a hypocrite. All right, good job. We've got a way higher percentage than in years past. We are all that. We say, hey, I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. I always say, well, come on, one more won't hurt. <laughs> we are in it together. We are in it together. It's hard to do what we know, and this series is going to help you get back to some basics that maybe you know, but it's really difficult to live out. Write it down this way. Lack of preparation will cause you to miss the point. When we don't prepare, we don't prepare the soil, we don't let God work in us, we miss the point of life, the point of what God's trying to do in us and through us in our own hearts. This applies to finances, but it also applies to spiritual disciplines throughout the week. It applies to Sunday mornings like we are in the midst of even right now. In fact, let me apply it for a moment to Sunday mornings. What if, let's just play a what if game for a minute. What if I showed up like this? Hey guys, what y'all wanna talk about today? Which one? What, I'm taking requests. Right. Yeah, yeah, you might have some, and then I'd be scared to death too because I wouldn't feel prepared. No, you expect me to be prepared because you've come thinking, believing, and let me ask you, do you expect that your pastor, whoever's up here, and it doesn't matter if it's me, it doesn't matter if it's one of our teaching pastors, teaching team, elders, whoever's gonna be up here, they're gonna be prepared. Do you expect that out of us? Raise your hand if you do. Good, that's a good, good church member would say, absolutely, we expect that. We expect that out of ourselves. God expects that out of us. But let me, let me make it personal for everybody else. Just like it's important and it's a call of God and it's obedience on our part to be prepared to spread the seed of the word of God, it's equally as important for you to come prepared in your soil to be ready to receive the seed of the word of God. And the same is true in spiritual disciplines in life. The same is true in finances for all of us. In every area of life, God has called us to be prepared. Spontaneous generosity, emotional giving, those things are good. God uses those things. Some of you probably gave and you, maybe you didn't give to the Lord, you didn't tithe, you didn't do any of that all throughout the last year, but our Give Light offering, you gave. And that's awesome. God uses that kind of generosity. That's not bad generosity, that spontaneous kind of giving. God, we should always be ready a fertile soil, open-handed to give in such a way. But God calls us to be planned. God calls us to be prepared, to prepare our hearts to be a continual, increasing, multiplying giver. And I know some of you are thinking like, where are you going with this? With the tithe? Are we going to the 10%? I'll talk about that next week. Uh, you may not like the answer because Jesus took the 10 and blew it up and added a zero basically is what he did. There's the, answer, the short answer. We'll look at that and unpack it next week as we look more at the how and the promises, the vow that we're going to look at next week. But God has called us to plan. Plan generosity is what we are called to. So let's read a parable that Jesus told. Luke chapter 12, find that in your Bibles, if you will. Luke chapter 12, and I'll start in verse 13. But this is a parable that Jesus told when he was being tested, asked a question, but it has to do, it's one of those, some 13 parables. Gee, listen, some 15% of the preaching of Jesus had to do with money and possessions. Uh, in the gospels, almost 10%, almost 300 verses, almost 10% of the gospels have to do with money and possessions and stuff. There are over 2,000 verses about money, possessions, and stuff in the whole Bible. To put that into context, you think prayer's in the Bible a lot? Raise your hand if you think prayer's in there. It is, no trick question. It's in there about 500 verses, but money, possessions, and stuff, over 2,000 verses. Do you think God knew that our money was gonna get us if we weren't careful? I think so. And so he told parables just like this one. The rich fool is this parable. Luke chapter 12, let's read the whole thing. Luke 12, 13 through 21. You ready for the word again, church? Let's dig in even deeper. Jesus shares this parable through this context. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard. Write that down, circle that, underline that in your Bible. We're gonna come back there. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, any of you think to yourself and end up talking to yourself? Well, the rich fool did too. I'm in his category. He said, 
what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, (laughs) you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up, for, lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, this parable is not something that says it's bad to be rich, by the way. God blesses people who are some of the most generous people I've ever met in my life, and they have all kinds of resources that I personally would never even dream of having. We've watched that. Even through our, our Give Light offering, we've seen that. So this parable is not against having stuff. It is, however, pointing us to how we should invest whatever level of stuff God entrusts to us. And so what I want to do with this parable is give you three principles of preparation. Three principles of preparation from Luke 12, 13 through 21. We see that question in the first couple of verses, but the first principle of preparation comes from verse 15, and it is perspective. Write that down, perspective perspective. Verse 15 is right after Jesus started and right before he shared the parable. And he said, take care and be on your guard. I had you underline that. Against what? Against all covetousness. This is greed. This is wanting what is not ours. This is valuing earthly stuff above eternal stuff and it controlling and consuming us. Why? For one's life does not consist in the abundance of one's perspective or possessions. And so he's talking here about a perspective of contentment contentment. And we live in a world that is consumed by uh, comparison. We scroll through social media. Social media is a great tool when used properly, but sometimes it it funnels, it fuels comparison. We compare to what he has or she has or how much money they've got or what they look like or I wish I had what they have. And it fuels this covetousness. Comparison kills contentment and comparison always fosters covetousness, greed, getting consumed by the earthly. This is the kind of stuff, the kind of perspective that Jesus is describing. And I've learned when it comes to finances and really any other spiritual discipline, that our perspective, how we see, is going to either become one of two things. It'll become a passport that sets us free to travel in places in our mind, in our heart, and in our life that only God could do. It'll be a passport for us or it'll be a prison for us. It'll lock us up in chains and we'll drag it around as a ball and a chain. So I ask you, what is your perspective? Is it a passport or is it a prison? And especially in regard to generosity and finances. And what I've learned about the presence of God is this, that God's presence always changes my perspective. God always meets me where I'm at, but he never leaves me there. He always pulls me forward. Sometimes kicking and screaming, he pulls me forward. And he changes how I see. And this is the perspective of contentment here. And I want to give you an illustration of this because really, Here's what Jesus is teaching us, that there's more to life. Don't miss this. There is more to this picture you call life. There is more to this counterculture generosity thing than maybe you have seen. There's more to the picture than you think. So I want to show you a picture. Here's a picture. Check it out real quick. How many of you, you saw the monkey first? Okay, put your hands down. A lot of monkey. How many of you saw the lion first? A few of you. How many of you are blown away that there's a monkey and a lion in this picture right now? (laughs) There are. If you look at the white, you see the lion? Look at the white. You see the lion? See the monkey is in the black. And some of you are like, wow. Some of you saw the big picture at first. Some of you are like, wow, I'm blown away. I didn't know that there's a lion and a monkey there. And this is what God wants to do with your perspective. He wants to open your eyes for you to have light bulb moments to see there is more to this picture than what I first saw. There's more to being counterculture than what I first understood. There's more to counterculture generosity than maybe what I've always been taught or what I've always thought. God is ready to broaden your horizon today. And covetousness is this greed. Comparison is going to kill it. Jesus, is in verse 15, is reminding us that when we see as God sees, when we see that our life does not consist of the abundance of our possessions, that there's an eternal thing that's bigger than the earthly thing, then what you're going to see is that this statement becomes true. Until Jesus is enough, no person or thing will ever be. I want to say that again because that will preach. Until Jesus is enough, no person or thing will ever be. 
It's a perspective, it's a contentment perspective, and it's the first part, it's the first phase, the first principle of preparation that we are looking at. Let's talk about the second one. The second one is planning. The first is perspective, the second is planning. And in verses 16 through 19, what we see is that the rich man, he prepared in some ways, but not in the ways that he should have been prepared. He didn't have a plan for not just the lack, he didn't have a plan for the abundance. He had all this stuff and he said, what am I gonna do with this stuff? Hey soul, I got an idea. Why don't we just build bigger things, store it up and just enjoy life. And there's a lot in scripture about enjoying life. Did you know that? Look at me for a minute. God does not want you. Listen, we've talked about this in times past. This is a form of legalism and a form of, of religion that God doesn't want you. And God wants you to be blessed, but it doesn't mean that you're always going to have an abundance. You ever notice that? Following Jesus does not mean that you're going to have everything you want. Your bank account's always going to be full. You're never going to have health issues and diagnoses. In fact, no, Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, hey, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will have trouble, but you can take heart because I have overcome the world. At the same time, when God blesses us, he wants us to enjoy the blessings. This parable is not against that. It's how we prepare. It's what we do when God blesses us, when we have an abundance and when we don't have an abundance is what we've got to have a correct perspective of contentment about. And then we've got to be prepared. We've got to plan as the rich person did not. The rich fool, listen, he did not plan. And so he created a problem. And I want to make that personal. When we don't plan, we just create a lot of problems. Can I get an amen? You've probably created a lot of problems where if you'd have planned and thought, maybe it wouldn't have happened. Some things you can't prepare for. So how do you prepare in a world where you can't prepare for everything, right? That's what we're looking at, and that's what we're learning from this parable. And let me just ask you, how many of you are more spontaneous kind of people? You're spontaneous. You just go to flow. I, I'm kind of more naturally a planner, um, myself, but Jessica is more spontaneous. And I thank God for her because she has made me do spontaneous things that I hated her for in the moment that I now thank God that she has made me a more spontaneous person that goes with the flow. And if you want to become more spontaneous, I got two suggestions for you. Have kids and go into ministry. And if you really want to learn to be spontaneous and go with the flow, do both. And I've done both and I've learned to be more spontaneous. I thank God for spontaneous people. So this is not a condemnation of a certain personality type. This is a biblical call to prepare no matter what personality type that you have. And a good way to do that is to not, I'm going to say it, another P word, a lot of P words today. Don't procrastinate. How many procrastinators in the room? Just be honest. We don't put church smiles. Okay, I see you guys. Hey, way to be honest. God sees you too. We don't, when we procrastinate, here's what I'll tell you. Procrastination is often the greatest enemy of preparation, of being prepared. And so, and, and I, see, I see some elbows. You keep them elbows yourself. God's coming for you too. Just hang on a minute. <laughs> a good way to be prepared is to budget, budget. Yeah, some of you have a budget. Some of you, like, that's foreign language to you. Listen, we've got a great, great class called Financial Peace University. It's launching January the 19th, and we want to invite you to be a part of that. You can pre-register at blackhawk.fyi. It starts January the 19th. And I even had a great question after first service. It's a wonderful question. It was a farmer who said, what about when you don't have fixed incomes? Can you still plan? Can you still prepare? Can you still budget? What does that look like? And th- you're right, it's, we got a farmer over here. There's a few farmers in the room. It's harder to, but there are things you can prepare for and that is addressed even in those classes. So we'd love to even help you do that because we think it is a biblical thing to budget and to plan to use your resources for the glory of God. This is the planning that even the rich man didn't do. Isaiah 32 and verse eight says it this way. Be gen- but generous people, Plan, I'm just making sure y'all are awake. Plan, we gotta do better than that. All the procrastinators are like, nope, I'm not saying it. (laughs) But generous people, plan, one more time. But generous people plan to do what is generous and they stand firm in their generosity. Three principles of preparation is perspective, is how I see, it's a perspective of contentment, it's planning. Number three, in verses 20 and 21, purpose. When you see as God sees, you plan towards the purpose of God. And that's what we see at the end of the parable where God shows up and he says, I'm just going to build bigger barns and store it all up, eat, drink, relax, be merry. But God said to him, verse 20, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, he did prepare, he just didn't prepare for the right purpose. And that's what God's saying to him, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I want to be rich towards God. 
You know, I, I want to I really invest in what is eternal with my life. And preparation requires and leads us into planning. But what do you plan around? You plan around God's purpose. Plan around what God has for our lives and the things he prepared, who are they going to be? How many of you have ever heard the phrase, you can't take it with you? Heard that? My granddad always said that. He went home to be with Jesus this year, and that's one I can remember him so many times. You can't take it with you. He'd say it when he was going to He spend a lot of money. You ever use that phrase to justify a dumb purchase before I've done that? Hey, I can't take it with me. Might as well, right? He did that, but he, was, he did great with his finances too and taught us a lot of great principles. But he would say, you can't take it with you. But some of us, we really do, from an eternal sense, think that something like this is going to happen. Check out this picture. <laughs> we think that there's going to be a U-Haul behind the hearse. And even if you can arrange somehow to have a U-Haul behind your hearse that's going to carry your casket, I want to tell you, you can't take it with you. From the earthly to the eternal, you can't take it with you. But you can send it on ahead. You can invest in eternity. You can make eternally minded decisions with your earthly possessions. And instead of building up treasure on earth for myself where thieves come in and steal and moth and rust destroy, we can invest it in the kingdom. We can, as Jesus said it, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then these things will be added to you. It doesn't mean everything you want, but it means you'll have everything you need. God will provide for you. And more than that, your eternity, which is way longer than the earthly anyway, is going to be full of eternal investments. You can't take it with you. But let's send it on ahead, shall we? And let's do that through preparation. Let's be prepared to do that so that we can have the right perspective that leads to planning, that now leads to us planning around God's purpose. And so let me ask you a, a couple of personal questions. Can I do that about the purpose of God in your life? Just between you and God, how are you investing your time, your talent, and your treasures in, maybe you draw two columns in your notes if you wanna do some homework this week. My plans, God's purpose. My plans, God's purpose. You could also add earthly, my plans, eternal, God's purpose. How are you investing your time, your talent, and your treasure in my plans, the earthly? And how am I doing that in the eternal column, in God's purposes? You might be surprised. I've done that this week and it was like, ooh, yeah. I need, to, I need to open my eyes and, and have a new perspective, see in a way that I can now plan differently to invest more in God's purposes. This is preparation. And so as we've looked at that today, I wanna get even more practical and real with the next part of the verse, which is point number two, principle number two. Write this down, it's praise. Offer to God. This is our first part, it's preparation. Number two, it is praise. What do we offer to God? A sacrifice of thanksgiving. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. This phrase is, could also be translated, make thanksgiving your sacrifice to God. It could also be translated as praise. Make praise your sacrifice to God. And so let's talk about how we praise. And man, I gotta tell you, first service, God just, he made this point really real to me in a way I didn't prepare myself for because the unexpected happens right over there was a man of God who many of us know. He's the coach of our basketball team, Coach Mark Davidson. He sat over there in their spot. They fill up like three rows over there. And he sat over there. And during our worship time, I watched this man. Many of you may not know, he's battling cancer. And he's coaching the boys. And he sat over there and just worshiped with all of his heart. And every single time I talked to that man, every time, since his diagnosis, every time he'll say, Pastor, to God be the glory. Every time. And I watched him praise God this morning. And it, and it just becomes really real, doesn't it? When you see people going through times, and some of you are as well, where it's really hard to praise. It's really hard to praise. It is a sacrifice to offer thanksgiving. A sacrifice of thanksgiving, it's, it's, it's hard work to praise God, but Psalm 118 and verse one tells us this, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. And I watch people like Coach living that in a way that I pray none of us have to live. But he says every time, and the church just thanked him and we clapped and we praised God for him. And you know what he did? This right here. Without a word, this man is praising God and preaching sermons way louder than any I've ever preached from this stage. You can do the same thing. Give thanks to the Lord. He is good. 
His love endures forever. Gratitude is it always going to be a spirit of an eternal perspective because we realize, God, you would save a sinner, a wretch like me, and you can't help but be grateful. The more we realize what God has done for us, that he's the ultimate giver. For God so loved the world that he gave. He is the ultimate giver. The more we realize how much we have to thank God for. And so I want to point you to praising God and being grateful today because right down this way, gratitude. Gratitude is the gateway to generosity. I want you to think about, in your mind, do not look at them. (laughs) Don't point at them if they're in the room. Of some of the least generous people you've ever met in your life. The Scrooges. We had Scrooge on the screen uh, over Christmas. Think of them. Keep your eye face forward. I saw y'all peeking, looking around. Don't be doing that. Remember, I'm coming for you next. What I'll tell you is that the least generous people that I've ever met in my life, they're usually the least grateful people too. Always negative, always complaining, always looking at things through the worst possible lens. But now I want you to think of the most generous people you know. If you can think of one, who's the most generous person you know? You can look at them now. This, they'd like that. Go for it. Think of the most generous person you know. The most generous people I know, my granddad was one of them. He helped people all the time. He had a lot of money. He was a farmer as well, and he helped people every chance he got. He did mission trips, whether his church did them or not, all the time, and I'm so thankful for him. And you know what I've always noticed about him and about others and probably about the people that you're thinking about? They're always the most grateful people I know too. They're positive, and they're like, you know what? I'm just going to give because God's given so much to me. I'm blessed. In the worst moments, people like Coach, I'm blessed. I hear him say it all the time, to God be the glory, positive, grateful, grateful that God would use somebody like him and even use the toughest things in his life and in the lives of others. And here's what you should know is that gratitude and generosity, they go together. Do you know that? Gratitude and generosity, they go together always. If you want to be more generous, be more grateful. Start with your gratitude. Start with the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And gratitude and generosity really are some of the greatest tools or some of the greatest forms of worship. And this is praise, what we're talking about. And worship, listen, it's not a song that we sing. You can do it while you sing, for sure. Worship is not a song that we sing. It is a life that we live. It is a perspective that we have. And this is the beginning of generosity. And I'm going to tell you, friend, it is counterculture. It's not natural to think that way. It's natural to to post, not be pre. It's natural to be negative, not be positive. It's natural to be ungrateful, not to be grateful. But worship of this kind, a perspective like this, praise, a sacrifice of thanksgiving, it shows up in how we love, how we lead, how we learn. It shows up in how we show grace to other people. It shows up in how we give with generosity. It shows up even in how we grow as a follower of Jesus. But here's what I know. When it comes to being thankful, it comes to being grateful, gratitude is sometimes really difficult. Some of you right now are like, I'm not going to be grateful. If you knew what I was going through, you wouldn't be up there preaching at me to be grateful. And you know what? I might agree with you. But I know that the power of generosity and the power of gratitude to lead us into a counterculture generosity is so powerful. And so for some of you right now, I want to give you two words that I just hope ring in your ears all week. Write these two words down. It's the simplest sermon point you'll ever see. Praise anyway. In times where you have what feels like an abundance, I'm going to praise. In times where I feel like I have nothing, I will praise anyway. In times where it's going great, I will praise. In times where it's going so bad, I don't even know if I can get up to face another day, I will praise anyway. In times where I see really clearly God's purpose and his plan, I'm going to praise. In times where it feels like I can't trace his hand, I've just got to trust his heart and I don't see what God is doing. I don't see how a good God could have used something so terrible, could even allow something so terrible in my life. When those times come, I will praise anyway. And when we learn to praise anyway, it changes everything about life. It changes our perspective, changes how we plan, and it changes how the purpose of God manifests in our life. It changes preparation, and certainly that praise becomes powerful. And when it does, we can take on the perspective of praise that the Apostle Paul talked about to the church at Philippi. Philippians 4 and verse 11, he said this, I've learned, it's a learning thing. Some of you, like me, you're still learning. Say it to your neighbor, say, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Paul said, I've learned in whatever situation I am. How, How many of them? 
whatever, all of them, in whatever situation I am, to be content. Preparation and praise. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. I want to give you two application steps. Uh, questions that I can help you turn into a list that you can make this week because we want to make this practical because we don't just want to be hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word. The first question is this. In what areas have I already planned to be generous this year? Some of you make budgets and you already have your budget. We work on ours and we redo ours and we look at that the last week of every year, every single year. This is just what we do. been doing that for many years and I encourage the same in your life as well. This is basically your budget. Make a list of what you've already planned to invest in. It's like, well, I'm not investing in anything. Well, I ask you, do you plan to wear clothes? Do you plan to eat this year? Groceries, you got some bills you plan to pay? Well, you've planned to be generous. You're more generous than you thought. <laughs> you're, you're gonna be generous in areas. You're gonna make investments. So make a list of what areas, if you have a budget, use that. If you don't, maybe let this be the beginnings of a budget of where you're planning to invest. And what areas have I already prepared to be generous this year. It's an easy, simple starting point, and it can lead you to the second question, which is this. How can I prepare to praise God? Those are our two points, preparation and praise. How can I prepare to praise God in these two key areas, through my gratitude and generosity this week? And just write that down. Ask yourself those questions. And so two ways you could do that is make a list of things you're grateful for, and then make a list of ways you can praise God for those things. I'll give you some ideas. Have a set time every day this week to just pause and pray only to thank God. Not to make a petition, not to ask for anything, but just to say, God, I'm gonna take this list and I'm gonna thank you for what's on the list. That's, that's one idea. You come up with better ideas. Find ways to praise this week. That'd be the first way you could do that. The second one is make a list of some steps of generosity, some counterculture generosity, some steps that God would have you to take. All right, and then next week, I'm gonna give you some, even some more uh, opportunities to see ways. We have a person in this room right now who did something I've never even imagined before. I'm gonna share about it some next week for my kids, and I'm gonna share about that as an illustration for next week's sermon. Some ways that you just find that God will put things on your heart to be generous, and it really is more blessed to give and to receive. Uh, with that, I want you to just bow your heads for a moment and just ponder what does it mean to live a life of preparation, to live a life of praise, and to see what God can do through you. How can I prepare to praise God this week through gratitude that leads to generosity? Believers, pray for that, and I believe God will put steps on your heart today. And some of you right now, under the sound of my voice, or maybe they'll even see this message years and years from now, who knows? I want you to hear the gospel really clearly today. And it's John chapter three and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. He's the ultimate giver. What did he give? He gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. He thought of you. He thought of this moment. He lived a sinless life that you could never live. When he came that first Christmas, that's why we celebrate Christmas. He came for a purpose. That purpose was you. He lived a sinless life you couldn't live so that he could die to pay a price for your sin you could not pay. And he rose from the dead and he's alive. And because he lives, we can have eternal life. He defeated your sin separates you from God. In your words right now, would you cry out to God and just say, God, I need you to save me. It's hard to believe that your grace would apply to somebody like me, but I trust in it. Trust in you, Jesus, to save me, not in me, not in my good works, not in somebody else's faith. Will you ask Jesus in your own words to forgive you and save you? He'll do that right now as we all pause, ponder, reflect, and then now respond to what God is doing in our hearts. Will you take a moment to do just that?